Yeah, this is a, a Gary LaFontaine pattern. Uh, when he first developed the pattern, they didn't know what beads were back in the day. I didn't know what they were either. <laughs> we didn't use them. But uh, so he used uh, lead wraps underneath the marabou. But uh, we're using the, the bead head version because everybody likes bead heads and the bead heads are better at breaking rod tips and uh, lead wraps. But uh, there's a bunch of books out that Gary wrote and then uh, Alan Gretchen Beatty kicked out. This uh, this one here is a really good one because it shows uh, the, the bead head version of it. And uh, the pictures in, in their book are a lot better than uh, the hand-drawn ones in LaFontaine's books. And it uh, goes back in any pattern that LaFontaine wrote about. Just about all of them are good. Even that crazy-looking uh, fly called the Mohawk, which is basically a bunch of deer hair with a hackle in uh, front of it. You wouldn't think that thing works, but it's amazing when uh, you get in a situation where you can't catch a fly in the river. You throw out a mohawk and the fish just bang it. I don't know why, because it doesn't really look like anything other than a badly tied bass bug. But uh, this book is really good, and it, it shows all the different patterns. And he also wrote a bunch of other ones, uh, the dry fly and the caddis flies. And then he's got another one underneath uh, my vice that I'm not, I'm not going to pull out right now. But uh, if you're looking for really, really good books with a lot of innovative patterns in them, that uh, these are really well thought out. He was a real thinker and uh, quite a good tire. And some of the flies look kind of weird, but uh, they all catch fish. But uh, this pattern, the marabou worm, it's a really simple pattern uh, to use. It's basically it's just one uh, piece of marabou, you know, plume. Then it's a uh, little foam. Uh, piece on the end and well, let me see if I can, where did I put them? Oh, here they are. That uh, you just buy uh, the little foam tubes and then you just slice them perpendicular to uh, the line of the tube. And then you get something that looks like, uh, here's, a, here's one of the completed flies. You can use all sorts of lengths and sizes of hooks. The really nice thing, the thing I like about the bead head is it gives you that great action. And the tail with the foam, right, keeps going up because it floats. So you get, a, you get a really nice jig action, plus you get the tail action when you're using it. And uh, it's a simple fly to tie. So you can tie a pile of them in a lot of different colors. Uh, the colors I like are uh, olive uh, and black are my favorites, right? If different ver Different colors of olive. But, uh, you know, you could tie it in maroon, uh, you know, people tie it in red. I don't, I've never tied it in red, but I know that the black maroon and uh, all the different shades of olive work really, really well with this pattern. Uh, and it's nice, the fact that it's, it's, it's cheap to tie, so you can tie a pile of them and uh, not cry too bad when you uh, lose one on the, the, the inevitable millions of branches that uh, surround our trout ponds and lakes here when you're casting toward shore to crank them in. And uh, so, yeah, we'll get started on here. So first, what we what you have to do <clears throat> is you, you, you get your marabou plume. And you cut back to the stems, not as thick as it normally would be. Cut it with the scissors. I do it on an angle. Make a jab in there a little bit better. Everybody see that? Then you get your, uh, there. Show you what the piece looks like. The piece is just a little foam piece, right? That you just cut. And what you do, you, you get, once you get it cut, you take your needle. You just jab it through the foam. And you get it on and you push it down the needle to widen it out a little bit, just like that. And then if you, you think the hole is a bit too tight with your smaller scissors, not your big scissors, you could take it and stick it in one of the holes and just push it down the scissors like that. And uh, you'll have the one end, it'll be a little bit fatter. 
Then you get your marabou and you stick it in that fatter hole. Slide it on the feather, just like that. And this pattern, uh, tail's twice as long as a uh, hook shank. So depending on what hook you're wearing or, or you're using that day, right? Whether, you know, like your three or four X, uh, this is a 3901B. And I'm using this one because it was on my fly tying desk, not because I prefer it, but uh, it is a good hook. Then you match it and see that's too long still, see? Slide it down. And at this point, you're going to, you're thinking, well, maybe I'll just go in there and super glue it and get that part of it over with. You want to do the super glue in last because you're, you know, you're, you're, you're manipulating it and, and curling it and getting it to length. And uh, sooner or later, if you do enough of that, right, you're going to glue your fingers together. So that's basically what you do. You start, to, then you get your thread, start your thread. Do you want me to use a, I'll use a brighter color. I just wind it around, get the so the bead won't slide back. This fly doesn't have any ribbing on it, but if you want to rib it to make it a little bit stronger, uh, you can do that with the marabou. But uh, I normally don't do that. Uh, I've never had a real issue with these flies coming on, you know, you know, tore up. I end up losing them in the weeds. Uh, before I usually do that. But so you, t you take this one, you know, that's one length, right? And then you measure it again and you clamp it off. You just manipulate it. So, you know, it's, so it's about like that. That's about two lengths. It's so simple that uh, you can do a half inch whip finish here if you want right off the bat, just to tie it down, uh, bugger net up. Just get on, on there secure. So it's not twisting around. You just work your thread back up. If you got any unruly guys in there, just wet your finger and you just twist it. And you just wind it. Doesn't matter if you wind it toward yourself or away from yourself, as long as you just wind it on there. And the marabou forms a rope. That's pretty much it, right? It's a super simple pattern. This is pretty much it right here. And then you do your last part, which is the super glue part. I'll take it on, I'll put it on a needle. You go back to the tail, you kind of bend it over. You drop it on the inside and that's it for the pattern. And it's really, it's one of these patterns, right? That's so easy to tie. People think, ah, oh, well, that's not gonna work. But uh, if you use it, it, uh, it, has, it, has, it has great motion. And 
easy to tie. So you could tie, you know, you, you could tie a dozen and a bunch of different colors, no, no time at all. The afternoon, you could probably not, you know, make five or six different colors of a, you know, of a dozen of them, right? Uh, I'll vary the hook length sizes. I think in Colin's thing there, he mentioned, what was it three or four X? Uh, I'll mention, I'll do that all the way to, you know, the two X or the 96, 71s, you know, and, you know, th those flies, right? The 3906 is a good one too. There's lots of hooks out there to use, you know, that you can, depending on if you want long ones or skinny ones or short ones, you know, give them a try. They're really easy to tie. So that's just one right there. Any questions on it, you think? I'll put another one in. I'm using a go, I'm using a copper bead. I normally, like the, these are ones I've tied quite a back in the day that I just pulled out of my box. You know, I'd use the gold bead. So I gold or, you know, copper, my kid's big on copper beads. Uh, he fishes uh, a lot of those uh, small ponds west of Edmonton and the fish there seem to really like the, you know, the copper bead. And he's noticed the copper bead works better than the, the, the gold bead there. I'm not sure if that's, uh, the you know, all that, or he just likes copper. I'm not quite sure. I got a buddy that used to work at a lot of the fly shops there and uh, he likes copper. <laughs> so I think that's why Andrew likes copper because he does feed Andrew some patterns sometimes. What do you think, Murray? It, it couldn't be simpler, Carl. No. <laughs> yeah yeah really it's uh, you know it's it's amazing you know there, you know there's there's times and places for you know more complicated patterns and we do all tie you know you know more complicated patterns but you know this is basically you know a worm leech pattern right and, yeah uh, it, it'll 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 cross over to either version right whatever you want to call it at the time when you're fishing it and uh like the nice thing right yeah because the action with the, the tail that wants to float up and the, and the nose will want to dive with the head on it. Yeah. yeah. And, and cool. uh, La, La Fontaine did a lot of shore fishing. He didn't, uh, he used uh, flow tubes, but a, a lot of those lakes where he, you know, he fishes in Montana have, you know, they're in meadows and, uh, you know, they don't ha have uh, the birch and poplars, you know, coming to the shore like we do on all our Northern ones. Right. So he was able to get away with, uh, you know, standing there and casting like the English do right from shore. Right. So, you know, he, you know, Montana and the part of the world where he was at was, uh, it was pretty nice. Kind of like here, right? That, uh, yeah, real nice place to live, uh, great fishing. Uh, they, they, you know, he, you know, a lot of those, some of those lakes, I fished a lot of those lakes back in the day that, uh, you know, you do have to, you know, to be more effective, right? You have to use the YouTube or a U boat or, you know, or something like that. Right. And, uh, but this, this lends itself to, you know, the, the jig action as you're coming in, you, you know, creeping up. In the way yeah. it jigs, uh, unless you you know you're going through some really slimy stuff, right? Uh, it, it it can be pretty weed free, you know. But the the, the advantage we got, you know, being in boats and you know U boats and float tubes and all that, is you know take you know cast it in the shore, and then you know stripping it in like a lot of guys like to do. This is an extremely effective fly for that kind of thing. I've never I've never. Been What's that? In, in a little bit bigger size in certain colors, that might work for a walleye fly. Oh, yeah. I've caught walleye in the black ones. Yeah. And, uh, I don't know. When I, when I go to walleye, I, I typically tend to go black or white <laughs> or silver. Yeah. But uh, it, uh, it, it, it works really easy. And if you want to add flash to it, it's not too hard to add flash to it. Alan, if you're going to tie another one, your uh, little thread holder thing is right in front of your fly on the screen. There, okay, there we That's go. That's the one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> yeah, thread holders are nice, but they get in the way mm -hmm. for for viewing and stuff. But yeah, here's like here's another one. I think this is a Daiichi. I had a back bag. Or another thing of Daiichi ones on my uh, fly tying table, but for the life of me, I can't find it right now. Or probably my blue jeans or something. Either that or my dog ate them. But the beagle's not in the house anymore, so I don't have to worry about the beagle eating things. Beagle, beagle moved to Vancouver. So now he's a, a hipster.
but yeah, it, you know, it's a standard wind, you know, wind your thread back until you get to, uh, you know, where the barb would be. Um, most of these have the barbs pinched because, uh, like the mustads, right. They have a prominent barb, right. So sometimes it's a, a you know, you really got to put a lot of pressure on it to pop it around that barb. So it's just easier to smash the barb down if you, when you're tying. And if you're in a, you know, and if you're cost conscious on your flies, this is a good pattern for somebody who doesn't want to spend a huge amount of money on flies, right? Cause it's, it's just basically it's two things, right? Or three things, the hook, you know, the marabou and the bead, right? And you don't have to use the tungstens, the, you know, the regular brass, the tungsten, of course, gives you better action because it's heavier, you know, in any given line or uh, bead size, but uh, the regular brass beads or whatever they're made out of uh, works just as well too. So, you know, if you've got an old stock of brass beads, I know everybody likes, you know, moving to the tungsten, including me. But uh, if you've got a pile of old brass ones, you know, this is a perfect fly to use those up if you want to, you know, and get rid of those that have been sitting in the background for quite a while. But uh, yeah, you just do it. It lends itself to really fast production. And you could whip finish that or you could put, a, you know, a dab of glue in there if you want. I don't get too particular about them. And then you just take it and twist it, right? I wouldn't worry about the st strands to get a little bit loose because they'll get bound up or, and if they look a little bit errant, you could just always just snip them off. One thing with, with marabou, right, is you move towards the, the butt of the, the feather, you, you get you get the thicker ends, right? Oop, my screen's over there, but my camera's here. You, you, you get the thicker ends, and you don't want to really use that real thick end because they'll wrap around the fly to a certain point, but then they'll, they'll splinter, right? And you don't, you don't want to be dealing with the splinter when you're tying the fly. Uh, like the blood marabou uh, feather, that feather uh, is a really good feather for a lot of different applications, but sometimes it can be a bit short. So the traditional, you know, package of, you know, marabou like these, right? You know, the standard length ones. And this is the UV one. You know, that standard length works well, right? Because you get enough of the real pliable part of the feather that you don't have to worry and, you know, f you know fight the thicker end, right? When you get back to the end of the fly here. Yeah, three or four turns on a whip finish, and then you can dab dab it with glue. I don't do this right with the bottle because I have a tendency to put too much on, and then you then you then you end up just having a big solid glob there of the fly. But yeah, then you take it and you just bend it and get it in there. That's all you need to do. Then it sticks in there really well. You could use the. Uh, there's a lot of guys now. Where's that cap at? Is, are using the the UV glue? Uh, I've got some. I you know, and I do use it periodically, but. Uh, I don't use it all that, all the, you know, like I would some of the other glues, right? I still use a lot of head cement and, uh, you know, the, you know, the super glue. And basically the Zappa Gap is the one I use, but there's a whole pile of other, you know, super glues that guys use that uh, that work pretty well, right? But uh, the Zappa Gap's always worked well for me. So uh, that's the one I, I use. I've used uh, some of the stuff you buy at the hardware store, right? But some of that stuff uh, they say is not water uh waterproof or so i don't know if the stuff degrades when you're using it but you know as, as often as you lose these things it wouldn't really matter if you're you know depending on how expensive your uh your glue is or how waterproof it is right i'm sure that if you use the hardware store stuff it'll work fine 
you know, the stuff you see people gluing their fingers together with, you know, that kind of thing, or split nail, split feet, and that kind of thing. Yeah, this is another good use for uh, uh, your bobbin rest, right? Just, just put your flies in there, just move it out of the way. Has anybody ever used uh, any of the LaFontaine patterns or this pattern? Haven't you ever used any of these or any of the LaFontaines? I use a sparkle caddis pupa thing. Or yeah, that, 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 that's a really good one. With and without wings and beads. And yeah, I use those. That's about really the only flies of his I've ever used. Um, so it's one person I don't have books by. <laughs> Someday I should buy some, but I've looked for caddis flies and I think it's out of print. And the last version I found, they wanted like 600 bucks for it. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's, it's, it's amazing uh, what they want. Like, uh, what was it? Oh, Barry Mitchell's. Uh, you know, uh, the Trout Stream Highway book. Yeah. That book, you know, you know, it's a paperback about you know, it's up over about there that big. <laughs> and, and you know, and if, if you if if you go and you look to, to to buy one off the you know you know Amazon or whatever, right? Guys are selling for like six or seven hundred bucks. And you're going, really? Come on! Right? <laughs> you almost you almost wish somebody you know uh, would would bring back Barry's book. Yeah, reprint you know, it. Yeah, but I don't know if that'll ever happen. So. So Some if, of those if, should be. Yeah, they, you know, but you know, there's a bunch of other ones out there too, right? Yeah. That uh, guys have written. Like McLennan's got a pretty decent book too, right? Yeah. And then uh, there's one uh, that mostly talks about the trout lakes and uh, the BC, you know, Alberta side of uh, you know the Rockies right on both sides of it, right? And that that's a you know that's a really good one too. But uh, yeah, Gary's been dead for quite a while now. He had well, he had ALS. I think had. Yeah, I was trying to remember yeah. what he had. And uh, yeah, that was tragic because eh? it, uh, he wasn't that old of a fella, right? When it oh. took him. And uh, I talked to him once, I you know, and uh, he had was... that uh, book mailer thing, right? And I, there was a lady that was, that, you know, worked with him at one point in time that was running the book mailer. I don't know if the book mailer is around anymore or not, but uh, he would answer the phone periodically. Was and, he, the, uh, he was the guy that would like snorkel and look at the flies underneath the river creek, didn't he? That's what I thought was him. Yeah, there's a couple guys that have done that, but yeah, he was the probably the most famous for it, right? You know, yeah. in the in the early days of Fly Fisherman magazine, right? Uh, there was uh, oh, a fellow that uh, he ended up drowning. He he slipped in a rock and banged his head, and and, <clears> and the guy drowned. But that that guy would uh, he was doing it too, and I think you know Schwebert and a couple of the, you know guys that fished in the East, right? Uh, yeah. Did a lot of that kind of stuff, right? But. Uh, you know, Gary was uh, probably the most famous for it, right? He spent a lot of time underwater looking at his flies. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think that's how his daughter learned how to cast, right? Because he, he couldn't do both at the same time. So uh, he dragged the family out there, right, to cast flies so he could look at them, right? And he'd get a nice pool on some yeah. river in, in Montana, right? And he'd watch the flies swim. And that's the whole thing behind the, his, you know, his diving caddis patterns and the wet fly patterns and that kind of thing, right? That some of them are pretty strange looking, like, you yeah. know, Oh, you the, like the Mohawk, right? Yeah. It's, it's cut kind of like a, you know, like a triangle, right? And uh, it's a goofy looking fly. And, uh, but it really works well. <laughs> Even those little sparkle caddis, the first time you look at them and the first couple you tie just look horrid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. And, and the, the, the thing with them, right, is uh, they're really not uh, a, fl a fly shop type pattern because, you know, yeah. now you go into a fly shop, right? And, uh, you know, everything's got rubber legs and all that kind of jazz. And you know, I use rubber legs too. And, uh, but you know, they're just not as, you know, catchy, right? No. But they <laughs> but work. The, yeah. And they're, they're, they're they, you know, they're incredible. Right. And, and this one, you know, falls into that same category as being super cheap to make. Right. And hugely effective, but it, you know, if it, it, definitely not on the fancy end of the scale. That's like the lightning bugs and uh, the evil weevils and Frenchies. Yeah. Yeah. The Frenchies, the, the Frenchies. I love the Frenchie. That's my go-to fly in the river. Yeah. When I, when I was in uh, uh, Czech Republic, right. 
I, I said, yeah, I had, I had to go there for work. And uh, I told one of my buddies that I fish in Chile with, right? I said, hey, Norm, I'm going down there. He says, you know anybody? And he says, oh, yeah, the captain of the, the Czech fly fishing team, right? And he says, yeah, he's a buddy of mine. He says, just call him up. So I did. And we went out, right? And he's in. Jan it looks like a normal fly fisher guy on the stream, right? You know, he wears a vest and it's jam full of stuff. And like, like everybody who wears a vest, right? They got about 85 fly boxes in there. But when in his, in his car in the back, he's got these huge fly boxes, like, uh, he's the saltwater guys use, but freshwater guys have adapted them, you know, and, but they're like, you know, 18 inches by 18 inches, you know, they're really big boxes and he, you know, he, he opened it up. And there's like, I don't know how many hundreds of flies are in each of his boxes, but he carries about 10 of these boxes. And there was one box that was like half Frenchies. And I was like, what's that? And he says, oh, this is the Frenchie. <laughs> and I said, well, if you've got that many in there, it must be good. And so, yeah, that's when I first learned about that one. Right. And uh, like a lot of the European imp patterns are super simple, right? Glorified pheasant tail. Yeah. Yeah. It basically <laughs> is what it is, but it's easier to tie <laughs> and stuff. But. Has anybody had any problem uh, getting that yellow uh, cylinder on there? How about Darren? I never have problems out. Come on. Oh, I know. That's I was just checking, though. It's your brother that has the problems in time, right? <laughs> I read the material list, and that had me confused because I didn't see a picture of it. I was like, okay, what is he doing here? <laughs> Well, yeah, because you look at it and say, he's missing something. <laughs> yeah, I looked at it going, okay, there's something here I'm not figuring out. Because like I said, I hadn't seen a picture of the fly. So I was like, okay, I'm not sure what he's doing here. But <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And your first thought was, yeah, Colin forgot to write down two or three different parts. When you, when you think about it, right? And you read, yeah, it's. It's amazing how simple it is. It makes, you know, it's even, they're, they're simpler, way simpler even than uh, Paul's woolly buggers, right? And, you know, Paul would love this pattern, eh? Because he would just say it's a woolly bugger without a hackle. And I thought I'd get a rise out of him, but I didn't. Is he on? <laughs> That's what it is. Yeah. <laughs> Did you hear me, Al? Yep, I heard you. Yeah. Yeah, you know, and... Uh, like all, you know, woolly buggers and all that kind of stuff, right? I think he got the idea on this one from a woolly bugger, right? And then it came from there. And see, when, when you get towards the end and, and you start hitting towards the thicker part of the marabou, when you start tying it, the thicker part will crank over, right? But once you got it in there, you got it in there. You don't have to worry about it. Doing a whip finish, I'll do it three, four times. I don't do it much more than that because uh, you don't need to really. Some guys, some guys that don't use glue will do it twice, but and this is using this stuff. Oh, Al, how tight do you try? Do you twist it? I twist too much, or I mean, it's, if I don't twist enough, it seems really bushy. I, I tend to twist it as, 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 as much as, you know, it'll kind of tell you, right? When you, you twist it to a certain point, then it kind of gets real stiff and stops. Then you got to force the twist. When you get to that point, when you're twisting it, uh, just stop. And you can just snap these off if you want, just to make it. But yeah, the, the, the marabou will tell you when it's, 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 it's tight enough. You can't you can't get it super thin unless you start stripping marabou off the the plume, mm -hmm. and then you got to get uh, this part of it. I'm always pretty conscious about when I'm using super glue because I'm one of them guys that has glued his fingers together several times. When I was, oh, I was about 
oh, before I started doing uh, heading down to Florida, working down there. That would have been about oh, 2021. Subaru was just came out, you know, and it was Whitlock was talking about how great this stuff was, right? And you know, had to go see Doctor uh, Doctor Ryan, who's an Irish doctor in town, right? He was the family GP because I'm, you know, I went into his office like this, right? <laughs> And uh, yeah, he wasn't uh, very subtle about stupidity, right? So he said, just hang on and gave it a good rip. <laughs> but, but it works well, right? And, you know, you do it on the inside, not on the outside, because you don't want to, you don't want your, the fluffy part of your tail to get matted down. And normally, it, you know, normally it doesn't, you know, do that, right? But when you take your, uh, you, your yellow foam piece, right? And you slide it on, you know, it's re there's a lot of resistance when you initially put it on because oh, the marabou is all fatter down there, right? But when you push it up towards the tip, it gets thinner. So you could pull this off, but I've never had a uh, the foam piece come off. And, you know, I've, I think I've had it once when I had the, I was using the fly and it, I caught quite a few fish on it. You know, the marabou sooner or later will, you know, it's, it's not like, uh, you know, fur wrapped with a rib, right? And, you know, sooner or later, it, uh, it'll it get mangled. But, uh, you know, especially if you're using it on the body. And, uh, you know, you, you, do, you know, the trout do, you know, do have pretty good teeth. It'll tear them up if you catch, use it a few times. But it's such a simple fly that I really don't worry about it. And like I said, if you wanted to use real thin wire, you could do that and counter wrap the marabou body and you'd make it, you know, even, you know, you know, even more tough for, you know, a fish to wreck it for sure. And then, you you know, you could, you could pull that when you're doing it, right. You can pull that tight and then, you know, the tighter you pull it, right. It'll, the middle section here will get a little bit thinner, right. As you, Cause you know, it, it'll slide the, the rest of the tips out. Right. But, you know, in water, the, the motion's fantastic on it. I think everybody should give it a go. It's real simple. You know, and really the benefit of it's, you know, it's not really, you know, if you're going to you know, be, be trolling, right? You know, nothing better than a pumpkin head for sure, right? Everybody probably would agree with that one or some variation of it or, you know, trolling streamers or whatever. And, uh, but this one, right, is just perfect for when you're pounding shore because you got the, you know, the, the jig action, right? And you, you know, you got the head dip in it and then you got the foam piece, you know, doing this, making, you know, that part of it. Right. So you got a dual movement in the fly. And I think that's why Gary liked, liked this pattern so much, you know, and, you know, in, in you know, pre bead days, right. They'd lap, he'd wrap the lead, you know, on the front, you know, the fore part of the fly, you know, you know, back, like back in the day fishing, when I was fishing the bull river 30, 40 times a year, Right. You know, we could put enough lead on our, you know, our woolly buggers, right. You know, there were 20, 30 wraps, of pretty thick lead on those things. Right. And, you know, chucking and ducking, there's a reason they called it chucking and ducking. Right. Because you'd, you'd, you'd have your big heavily weighted woolly bugger. Then you'd have a, a, you know, 18 inches back. You'd have, uh, you know, another weighted nymph of some sort. My favorite was the Brookstone uh, when I was, you know, fishing the Bull River all the time. And I, and, uh, you know, you, you always had to duck, right? Because one of those flies would slap you in the back of the head would give you a concussion, right? <laughs> and, uh, but the bead, you know, the, the beads now, right? Uh, you don't see as many of uh, the heavily weighted lead flies like you used to. You still see them, right? Because there, there is a good purpose for them. And uh, like, you know, fishing, this would be a good fly fishing uh, Jasper in a big size fish it in all white and with a silver bead and you, you put the bead and lead on it and you cast uh, at the river mouse of all the rivers that go into the Athabasca and Jasper and uh, bring your eight weight, right? Cause uh, those fish are big out there. When you hit, when you get the, the big bowls, you'll catch rainbows too, Athabasca rainbows, sometimes grayling too, but, uh, but lots of white fish too, but uh, they work really, really well out there too. So they work in lakes and rivers. And I know about the white one because my son, that's one of his favorite ones in a really like a size two. I taught him out of tie and he was actually a pretty good tire, but 
he figures the the, the fly shop at Al is probably the best uh, place to get fly, so he doesn't tie much anymore. You're not charging him enough, then, Al. I know I should. <laughs> But uh, yeah, I could tie a red one, just for contrast. This is that UV stuff. I don't know. That's not a good feather. See, here's a feather where you see it, where it's really thick. And if you start bending that right, you're going to break it and snap, and it's going to it's going to do that split, and then uh, it'll drive you crazy, right? Because there's nothing worse than having your fly bot just about done, and you find out the marabou is no good. Let's see if we can find another one that's better. Yeah, this one might be good. I'll wait and see on this one. Cut it at an angle. I cut it at an angle because it's just easier to uh, jab the marabou through the rubber. And if you do tie a bunch of them, right, it's just easy to get them, you know, you know take a couple of these tubes and just cut them, you know, kind of like that. You can see them all in there. And then you cut enough of them, right? And you got a couple of your supply. Hey, this one's, here's a fly. That's Dennis's. Boatman, that he likes to tie. This is a really good one, off subject. <laughs> so again, what you do, get it flat on the side. Can you see this? And you just jab it. And then just shove it through your bodkin. Normally, if I'm going to tie up a dozen or so of these things, but, uh, I'll do this step all at once. You know, do, do it like it's a uh, conveyor belt kind of tying, right? Just so you can, it just goes quicker if you conveyor belt style tie. I used to do that when I was, like if I, you know, back in the day, if I'm tying, like, you know, that guy orders five dozen atoms or 10 dozen, you know, you lay all the pair of wings out and then you lay all your hackles out and you, and then uh, you got what your stuff for your tails and you just go like that, you know, and if you conveyor belts tie this one, which you'd, you'd, you'd get all your marabou set up like this. And then it's just bang and crank and crank. And last thing you do then after everything's done is you'd go back to the, you know, however many dozen it is and just dab the, you know, the rubber, you know, cylinder, right. With the super glue and it, it, we, we would go even faster. Some guys just like to time one at a time though. Yeah, that's about right. Or typically for my olive and black ones, I don't normally use it. I won't use a normal, you know, a red thread or an orange thread. I don't know why I'd, I just normally tie with olive or black, depending on, you know, whatever color the marabou is. Al, can you comment on um, the strung versus select marabou plumes? Strung. Uh, works pretty good. Uh, it's not as good as some of the material that uh, the real select stuff that you pay a lot more for. But yeah, if you can get and go to a fly shop and look at the packet, you know, a lot of the cheaper strung is actually pretty good. But, you know, some of it's real stemmy. And, and you know, if you want to tie this fly, you don't want stuff that's super stemmy because then, you know, like I said, it splits. And uh, that's the advantage of going to a fly shop. Uh, you know, like 
I can, I can, you know, well, there's a fly shop in uh, Pennsylvania. I used to order from back in the day in bulk. Right. And I would tell the guy, uh, Reed's fly shop. And I, you know, I'd say, Hey John, I need this for, cause I'm tying this. And he would select it for me and send it. But you know, most fly tires, uh, when you, you call, you do mail order, you do, you call a shop up, you know, in Alberta or something, uh, unless they know you, you know, or, or the guy listens to you they'll thumb through their stuff, but they don't like thumbing through their stuff because they don't want all the thick stemmy stuff of all their marabou sitting there. Right. Cause then when the guy walks in, they don't buy that stuff. Right. If they know it, unless you know, like for woolly buggers, who cares? Right. You know, if it's, you know, if it's, well, I'm, I bought this for making uh balanced leeches. And so I don't really, you know, this, this is perfect for balanced leeches, but you know, necessarily for this kind of pattern, right. You don't want that thick stem. So you want a, a, the longer stem that's pliable. So, you know, sometimes paying for it, you know, uh, is, is better off, but you can look right you know, through a lot of the packages and see, right. And that's the advantage of you know, fly shop versus non-fly shop or not, you know, mail order calling it in. Right. And, uh, you know, cause I've used, you know, you know, you know, called Alberta shops back in the day. Right. And I'd say, I'm going to be down in a week, pick this up for me. And, you know, I just had to walk in and walk out, you know, back in the day. Right. And, uh, cause you know, like fishtails, right. I've known, uh, those guys since before they opened the store, right? you know, and you know, that, that, you know, you know, and back in the day, right. It was, you know, Hey, yeah. What do you think about this? And I, you know, and you'd tell them, right. But, you know, now Blair and all that, right. Uh, you know, they've got a hell of an operation there, right. And they're doing great, but most places, if you ask them, they can do that. Right. But you, uh, I always found it best to just go in and see what they have for sure. But just because the marabou's, you know, isn't, you know, it's too stemmy for this purpose, right? You know, most marabou, you know, you know, how often do you wrap a body with all marabou? You know, there, there are patterns that use marabou. But, you know, most of them don't. And most of it just use it for tailing and just about, you know, just about all this stuff is, you know, good for that. Uh, if you tie salmon flies, marabou is used as a substitute for, uh, they don't even, even hardly say it anymore, but they used to use it for, you know, e eagle. You know, there's, if you look at some of the old English patterns, Evan's probably seen this before, where they uh, say, you know, use, you know, use, you know, dyed bald eagle for, this right because it was like a marabou kind of uh consistency or stork was another one right storks the original marabou and uh but you know the marabou we get now right is is way you know is is pretty good quality you just gotta when you're looking for it you know if, if you're going to do a certain application with it like this you know the, you stem, the, the, the stem yeah <laughs> yeah you know <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, and, and, and I've got friends, right? You know, you're fishing BC, right? And you, you come around the bend, and there's like 20 bald eagles, you know, <laughs> and, and, and a goat. They're all sitting on, uh, you know, a, a sand spit in the middle of the river, right? And then there's always one guy who goes over and sees it, you know, lo is looking for that feather, right? And <laughs> you know, and uh, that's that's a feather you probably uh, you know shouldn't pick up, and I've never picked up, you know, anything like that, but. You know, occasionally you'll see guys walk around with eagle feathers, right? But uh, that uh, eagles, eagles, one one raptor, right? That uh, if you pick it up and you you take it in to get a permit, uh, you're probably not going to get the permit. Because uh, I I do know guys because uh, it is legal to pick a dead one up, but uh, the questions you're going to get, and that bird will definitely be X-rayed, and. Uh, so I've never bothered with it because, you know, it's way easier. And, you know, I'm not a dyer, you know, I, I did a little bit of dyeing uh, back in the day before my mother shut that uh, idea process down. And uh, cause I dyed uh, the, you know, the concrete utility sink in the basement, a couple different colors. And she wasn't too keen on that. So uh, I've never bothered with, you know, non-dyed stuff. Right. And uh, cause most of it's like, they wanted like a yellow kind of looking color. But well, 
but marabou is a uh, you know and and you you could take your head cement and cement all this too if you wanted to you know this one might not be long enough You'll hear guys, uh, you know, they'll, they'll talk about, ah, I can't get any good peacock, uh, you know, and, and they say, well, they can't, you know, and you'll hear guys talk about, yeah, the, the, you know, the, the marabou, right. But it depends on what you want to use the marabou for. And like in this case, right, you see that you'll get marabou, right, where the tips, are they're not fluffy like these are. And they're almost like it's the end of the you know, the, the, you know, the barbule comes out, but there's no fuzz on it, right? That's a bad marabou. I don't know if I've got any bad marabou here to show you, but you, you, you want stuff that looks like this, that has a nice, you know, feathery, you know, back end of it, right? So your tail looks good and everybody's, you know, you know, Paul can, you know, talk about this too, where you, you, you get a marabou feather and it looks just like little, bendy like thin strips and it's not fluffy and that marabou's uh i don't use that's crap but you know and uh if you ask you, you know you know you can go down to collins new shop right and say hey i need this right you know most of it looks you know the stuff looks like this right and uh but if you're mail ordering you're, you're trusting that fella to send you the right stuff you know and here's one uh you know, this one's all really good too, right? You, you look at the plumes and, you know, they're, you know, they're all, you know, nice and fuzzy. And that's, that's what you want. You don't want them where they're, uh, you know, real thin and there's, there's no, there's no uh, fiber to them. And th that more than anything, probably with marabou is that the, th the thing when you're selecting marabou, uh, the select should always be good. And uh, cause you're, you know, it's more expensive and you're paying for it, but uh, you know, like this stuff here is really, really good. And I'll have to, you know, I'll have to go through this material and pick out ones that are long enough, you know, before the, you know, the, the stem gets thick, but that's not to say this is bad. This stuff is, I bought this to make balanced leeches and it's perfect for that. But you, you probably wouldn't be able to tie a size two on it. These are sixes I'm tying on. So these are, it's a fairly good size tuck. Al, have you ever left the front of the uh, fly really bushy? Yeah. Uh, and how does that work? It works great because it's it, it's not quite a, a collar, but it gives it that collar effect. And when you, when it goes through the water, right, you know, it you know it breathes, right. So any anything that makes the fly more attractive, I think, is is good. And uh, sometimes you, you you don't get that. Well, you know, with, with uh, you know, the fly when you when you do that effect, right? But it can, you know, it's that's a, it, it's a good thing to do if you if you got the you know the extra was, marabou to do that. I was thinking if the if the marabou was a little short, and instead of having instead of twisting the marabou up, uh, just wrapping it um, forward, uh, palmering it forward a bit, and um, and then just uh, if you had, you might want to reinforce it with some wire doing that though, but it would really give, let those yeah, fibers can. stay up and fluffy. Eh? Yeah. There's that technique where they do wrap marabou, you know, with a wire and, you know, that would work for this too. You know, you know, just cause, you know, and LaFontaine would be the first one to admit it that just cause he ties it this way doesn't mean there's other ways to tie it. And like you said, that would be a good way of doing it. And then when you're when you're when you're punching a hole in the the yellow foam piece, and 
on black ones, I use black, but I also use yellow. And pretty much yellow is the one color I use on just about everything. I don't know why I do that. Uh, basically, I think it's because my foam that's this size, I've got it in two colors, right? Yellow and blue, right? For it blues my damselfly color. And, uh, but I do have some black ones and uh, they all work well. You know, and uh, the, the yellow might be uh, considered to be like a hot spot, I guess. You know, that's Gary Hankey would call it a hot spot. And, uh, but yeah, it, you know, it's, uh, it works. You, you know, try to get your, when you're jamming a whole pile of rubber cylinders, you know, with your, with your needle, right. Uh, you, know, you don't always get a per centered perfect, but I still use those. <laughs> yeah. And, and, you know, and it, and it still works well. Yeah, but this is a color that my kid likes. He likes maroon and and then the copper bead thing. Those are two colors that you know he really he likes. I've always been kind of a brass bead colored guy, but I have been using some some copper beads, you know, as of late. And I do like them. I, I use them on the balanced leeches too, with the you know, olive, with with the copper bead works really well. But uh, yeah, definitely uh, give it a try. And remember the tail's twice the length, right? You divide it, you know, so your rubber uh, cylinders, you know, roughly in the middle of the, the, you know, the fly, right? Or of the tail, rather. Does this have a tendency to wrap uh, L when you cast it, or is that tail stiff enough to uh, stay? Stiff, really st stiff enough. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Well, you got, because if, if, uh, yeah, that's a good point, right? Because, you know, the, the old rule of thumb, right, is the, the length of the shank, right? And there's a reason yeah. for that, right? As, as, yeah, as yeah. you know. And, <laughs> I've towed a few backwards. <laughs> yeah, 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 me too. <laughs> I think if anybody uses, you know, stuff with tails on it, you know, underwater, right? They, they run yeah. into that periodically. Yeah. And, uh, but with the rubber uh, on there and then, you, then you're getting the, the super glue in there, it kind of stiffens, you know, it up right yeah you could you're not so much getting the the tail doing this the tail ends up going there and, and you know and that's a stiffener part of the fly mm -hmm. so you, you, yeah. you know I'd, i've never i've never had that much of an issue uh i don't think i've ever had an issue you know with uh this pattern doing that but yeah woolly buggers like you know be, be, beginner fly tires are thinking wow you know that tail's going to be awesome and, you know, yeah, it looks pretty good, but yeah, you're right. Right. You know, they don't realize there's a reason why you don't go with a super long tail. If you like super long tails and you're really bent on, you know, doing two X tails, right. Get a piece of stiff mono and, you know, 30 pound, 20 pound, and then tie that in first and then tie your marabou kind of a, you know, around it. And that, and that thick mono, you know, will uh, prevent the, 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 the fly from, having the tail wrap around it because it sticks to it, it wraps around the mono effectively. That makes sense. Yeah. yeah. And so, you know, and some bass flies that I used to tie for guys, I used to tie tons of those that, uh, that uh, guys like longer tails and just about all those patterns, right. You'd stick, you know, a real stiff piece of mono in there or, you know, there's other things you could stick in there too. Right. You know, guys will do feathers, and the crystal flash is another stiffener, but I never like the really super long tails because you get, uh, you know, they do the, they do the nipping thing, yeah. And you know they nip the tail, and uh, you know, and one way to get around that right is to you know put a stinger hook off the bend of it, right? And you know, a lot of pike and bass fishermen they they like stinger hooks, you know, for for that reason, right? Because the the bass will sometimes just go and nip or perch do too. We all as we all know that when we you know go up and fish uh, sealy. And the, the little buggers are nipping at it and you, you get all these bites, right? But you never catch any fish because they're, they're banging the tail, right? And, they, and they're really good about banging just the tip of the tail, <laughs> you know. But yeah, this is, uh, the tail kind of acts as a unit. And with that, you know, cylinder in there, right? You don't get the, the feather kind of wrapping, right? Because it stays stiffer. And you can see with the UV that gets this kind of a shine to it. A lot of guys like the UV stuff, especially in the shallow waters, right? You know, if they're fishing shallow, the stuff's supposed to really, really work. 
and I know a bunch of uh, salmon fly guys, right? That uh, they're really big on a lot of the UV stuff. And uh, I think if those guys use it, then it just probably works fairly well. So, but don't be afraid to use the the old fashioned stuff too. And especially with this fly, right? You know, you're going to lose them because there's 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 there sticks and everything else, right? And I think when we were fishing, what's that one up near Big River? The lake up there. It's got nice brookies in it. Anyways, yeah, I lost about half a dozen of these. <laughs> Actually, I ran out. I had to switch over to uh, uh, back swimmers. And uh, that pattern of uh, that Dennis really likes is a killer up there. Yeah, that's that, his back swimmer pattern. I think it originally came out of BC, the one that Dennis really likes. But, uh, that, Dennis that's, Boatman, that, is that what you're thinking? Yeah, of? That, that, that's the one, yeah. yeah. That one, that, that one's uh, is a really good one. And uh, that's not too hard to tie. It's mostly coloring, right? On that one, right? Because it's, you know, the, the, the foam little, you know, bluegill fly body that you use for it. Works really good. So I'd say give it a try, and if and if you know anybody who's got a La Fontaine book, uh, you know, see if you get your hands on it and look at all the strange patterns. Right, he's got a lot of patterns on. Uh, they're they're up on the net. Uh, oh, what's his buddy? Uh, Jack Dennis. Oh. If if you if if you if you uh, ever see any of Jack stuff, Jack periodically, well, he'll he'll post. Uh, some, you know, a pattern that uh, LaFontaine, like just him and LaFontaine, and there's a half a dozen guys who were kind of did a lot of fishing together. And uh, so he, he periodically posts stuff that, uh, you know, Gary originated. And uh, yeah, like I said, Rick, I like it because it's so simple. And, uh, you know, you, you virtually got all the material sitting in your, you know, your fly box somewhere, right? You might not have the exact color you want, right? But you've got everybody's got marabou, <laughs> you know, because because they tie woolly buggers, and uh, so I, I, you know, I'd I'd give it a go, you know, and you know, and if you've got marabou that uh, the flex really flexible part of it is not that long, uh, get a short shank hook. You know, instead of using thirty six o or thirty nine o six b, get a thirty nine o six, which is a shorter you know, hook, right. Or, you know, if, if you don't, if it's not long enough to wrap on a three or four X hook, you know, find a two X hook and uh, they all work really, really well. Well, guys, I think this is the last of our Saturday morning fly tying sessions. Uh, I hope everybody enjoyed them and I hope, uh, hope you got a few keepers out of the, out of the group. I know I did. And uh, thanks very much to Al and, and our, all our previous fly tires for donating some time and some effort to make these happen. I think everybody enjoys these. I sure do anyway. Yeah. They're, they're you know, okay. the thing I like about them, right. Uh, well, this year, actually, I didn't get to a lot of them, right. Cause I was stuck down South working instead of fishing. That was a tragedy. <laughs> <laughs> you poor guy. <laughs> uh, you know, the weather's pretty nice down there. So I, I really can't complain about it, <laughs> but uh, you see stuff that guys uh, use and they like, and it catches fish. You know, like there's that, oh, that one pattern that Colin showed last year uh, with the crinky uh, fibers, you know, it was basically the, what's that, Darren, what are those patterns called, or that material called, that uh, you tie, it, it's a clouser with this material on it. And, uh, uh, Crelix. Crelix, yeah. yeah. And uh, that, you know, the copper and the, the you know, the, the green one, right? Uh, those are instant favorites of mine when I started using them, right? And uh, I had buddies down south, right, for instance, uh, tie this in copper. I was never a big copper guy, you know, back in the day, right? But uh, a friend of mine in our, he, he, he died a couple years back. Uh, Tony uh, Spezio, Spezio was a fisherman out of the White River, you know, Arkansas area. You know? And uh, he really liked copper. And then I figured, well, you know, if Tony likes it, you know, maybe it's probably pretty good. And, uh, you know, you know, the nice thing about this is this is local flavor. So these are patterns that, you know, 
guys in the club they find effective and you know and then they you know they demo them right so i think that's a great uh great value to guys who are looking for you know patterns and stuff or you find out who they are and you you, you snoop in their box and you know, see how to you know you you go into paul so you can see how to tie 150 different kinds of woolly buggers and uh they're all effective though <laughs> you know yeah cam knows that you know when you can't figure out what to do you run over to paul's box and if he doesn't hide it on you you know that kind of thing right and uh see what they're tying because it's always good to see you know there's the tried and true patterns right you know you know like you know brian's pattern you know his favorite pattern right and uh you know those we need to keep using right and but there's a lot of patterns like you know the guys in the clubs find hugely you know you know effective right and like you go into mine, right? Uh, mine's a bit shy and different variations of boobies, right? Because my kid cleaned my box out. But, uh, you know, you know that's a pattern that, you know, I found to be good. And a lot of the guys, you, you know, also use that pattern too, right? Because it's good, right? And, but it wasn't a pattern, you know, we, we saw a lot of, right? Until, you know, guys started, you know, seeing it and using it and finding out how good it was. And this is the same way. This is a pattern, you know with the benefit of being super easy to use and not a lot of fancy, you know, materials to put on it. Right. You know, you know, that makes it a really fast pattern to tie. So if you don't have a lot of time, this is a good pattern to use. Cause it's like a guide pattern, you know, and you know, you, you look at a lot of like Brian's patterns, right. Brian's patterns weren't uh, overly elaborate, but they were hugely effective in the you know, guides would call it a guide pattern because they're, you know, you, you can crank a pile of mountain, not spend time, uh, you know, three hours of device cranking stuff out. You know, you know, Evan, when he ties, uh, you know, he knows this too. A lot of the traditional salmon flies, right? Uh, they take, take me days. some of them could take days to do, right? <laughs> when I when I was doing traditional salmon fly patterns, right? Uh, you know, back in the day when, uh, you know, like I had one client guy come over and he'd give me condor feathers, right? And he'd say you could use an inch, right? And those <laughs> flies, those flies, those flies would take forever to tie. Is that you know the, all the things you, you you put on them right and uh, but for lake fishing you don't need a lot of that stuff and some of the stuff is we tie is really really effective right and not too hard to tie uh, you you know in BC when you go over there, there there's two versions of guys there's guys that don't have anything in in their box that has more than about three materials on it and then there's guys that you look at it and they're they're like works of art right and I I've kind of float in between the two. And, uh, you know, because I like the teeny nymph. <laughs> and that, that's just like this, right? It's like pheasant tail. That's all you put on it. And, uh, you know, so those can be, you know, super effective. But, you know, some guys like the real fancy flies too, like uh, Wally Lutz, the Wally uh, wing guy. That uh, Wally used to tie a pattern for, uh, oh, uh, what was that one? Uh, steelhead stream. That's where I caught my 45 pound Chinook. Oh, criminy. I can't remember the name of it off the top of my head. But uh, that pattern he tied, it was a stonefly pattern, it had 27 different operations on it. But he also sold it wholesale to the guy for 12 bucks to fly. And, and that's that, you know, <laughs> and that's a wholesale price. You know, but yeah, Wally would not tie that fly today because it takes too long to tie and there's too many parts to it. But uh, the nice thing about the LaFontaine patterns is when you go through them, there's not a huge number of you know, different materialists to them, right? The materialists are all fairly short. And, uh, you know, that's a real benefit, I think. So give it a go. It's a good fly. And it gives you a chance, gives you a chance to use up all your brass beads if you turn it into a tungsten guy. And, you know, and, you know and, and I know Evan likes tungsten and he's probably got 3 million brass beads sitting in his, his thing. <laughs> Yeah, there's a few. Yeah, everybody does. <laughs> this room's scary, actually. Yeah. Yeah, I know every once in a while, I, I'm going through trying to find something that I can't find, and I find more brass beads, you know, in a box somewhere. But uh, so, yeah, you know, give it a go. And, uh, you know, the nice thing, right, to, you know, is just it's, it's a good effect to fly. And it doesn't take long to tie. I think so. Try, to, I, try, I, try I, the different colors. 
I appreciate Thanks, it, Al. You're showing us a new a new pattern. We've had a lot of new patterns, and that's kind of neat because we learn what others, like you said, there's a whole variety of stuff out there. And if you're not familiar with it, having it yeah. introduced like this or these weeks, I really appreciate them. Not only does it get me excited for spring coming up, but learning something every time. So appreciate it. And a simple yeah. slide is good too. Yeah, that's for sure, Bruno. I agree with you totally. You know, and 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 uh, I've been in quite a few clubs uh, over the years, and what we've got in this club, uh, there's a lot of really good tires in this club. You know, like extraordinarily good, you know, tires, right? And uh, th that's what the you know these uh, you know sessions are perfect for, right? Because you get to see what some really really good tires, uh, you know, what they do, you know, and they they tie, right? And, uh, you know, take advantage of the guys, right. You know, you, you know, you know, talk to Colin, talk to Evan, talk to Paul, you know, you know, and, you know, even, you know, you know, cook, you know, you know, there's a pile of guys out there. Uh, you know, they were hellaciously good tires, right. That are more than willing to show you what they use, right. Take advantage of it. Right. Cause we really, we got a great resource and you know, the tires in the club. Are you fishing this on an intermediate line there, Al, or do you use a floating line when you're casting close to shore? Uh, I'll use I'll use an intermediate, but a, but you know most of the time when I'm out there on my two rods, I've got uh, a floater and an intermediate, and then uh, but if, depending on the lake I'm going to, right, I'll switch off. I won't have a floating on. I'll have an intermediate or a sink, depending on which uh, what lake I'm on. But I almost always have a, a float. And I'll go back and forth between the two. Okay. And, uh, but if I'm using a floating, it's definitely a longer leader. It's not a nine footer or a shorter one. It's if I'm at a floating line, it's, you know, uh, you know, 12, 15 foot, just yeah. so you can, you, you can get down and you get that jig action through the water. Right. You know, going like that, you want that longer okay. leader to, to, you know, to, to give it right. You know, with, you know, a lot of, uh, you know, sink, you know, sink, full sinking lines, right? A lot of guys will use, you know, uh, to huge effect, right? Uh, you know, the four and a half, five, six foot leader. And, you know, I do and other guys do. And, uh, but you really need a longer leader and uh, to, to work on that jigging motion, right? And, you know, and if you're working on a, uh, we get a lot of uh, points and submerged uh, drop offs and things that are fairly deep. So intermediate in that case will work better than uh, the floating. But like Shannon, for instance, right? This pattern uh, pounding in the shore because you know a good chunk of Shannon, right? There's not a big, you know, a big drop off, right? It's kind of a gradual thing, and especially when you're in the boat landing, you're standing and you're looking out at the lake, right? The whole left side of the lake, right, is kind of a gradual, you know, section. There's a lot of fish, you know, swimming in there, and uh, you know, you know, ask, uh, you know, Murray, right? With Murray caught a whopper of a brown, gosh, it couldn't have been more than about three or four feet of water. <laughs> you know, and actually not too far from shore. And uh, on the left side of the lake, that one time we were out there, that's the, I think the day I lost that one reel. That's still, I still cry over that one. But, uh, <laughs> and, th and thanks for finding my other one. <laughs> yeah, it was a, a real momentous day for, uh, for Murray, because it was a beautiful brown trout he, he caught. It was that was real shallow. I was I was kind of surprised where you caught it, right? Because that water's not deep there. And uh, you know, and, and then for me, right, uh, yeah, Murray uh, saved my probably one of my all time favorite Ross R reels that I've had since I was a little guy. And uh, but uh, that, you, know, uh, he, he, that, you know, what's that? That fish I what's that? I didn't hear you. I caught that fish on a booby. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and that's, that's another classic, simple pattern, right? Yeah. You know, and, uh, but you know, a lot of those lakes are like that, uh, and, you know, uh, Neslin, right. Has real nice open shallow areas, right. On the, the back end there on the other side of the Island. Right. And, uh, on the, on the highway side, right. There's some really good, you know, areas where you can you know, use a floating line. Right. But then there's areas on the, the, that side too, where you could switch off, maybe be more effective with an intermediate. But you know, Caddis and a bunch of them ones up north, right? Long leader on a floating line, right? Uh, you know, hugely effective. But the intermediate has its place, use in this fly too, though. 
But uh, LaFontaine, I think, almost exclusively used a, a floating with this one. But I think when he talks about it in his book, he mentions the floating, right? But, you know, there, he, he really liked the intermediate lines. And, uh, you know, our intermediate lines we've got now, uh, the clear ones right there, way better than the old ones, right? Because the old ones, if I, you know, mine, my old intermediates were gray. And uh, those things would not up something fierce, even more, even more so than these clear ones do, right? So somebody, somebody, need, somebody needs to make a fl intermediate line that doesn't not up on you when you cast and the big schnazzle, right? But uh, works pretty good. I've never used it on a sinking line, but uh, you probably could on drop-offs, you know, you know, big deep drop-offs. Like on the, you know, the one island at Neslin, right? There's, you know, it's on the island side towards the house, but it's still by the island. It, you get, uh, it goes, it does a gradual thing, right? Down to about, you know, 10, 12 feet. And then all of a sudden, bang, it goes down to, you know, you know, 20 something right there. Right. And so, you know, casting in that and sinking and having it, you know, it creep it up. But you need a depth finder, depth finder there to, you know, figure out where that drop is. Right. But yeah, that would be effective too, I imagine. I tend to crown bit fish more off that part than I do, you know, anywhere else, you know, in Neslin, but yeah, that would work there. But, you know, you've got all those grass beds too, where this fly would be re really effective. Not grass beds, reed beds. And the down, the down trees, you know, in, in the back there, this, this pattern works really well too. That's where you donate the flies. Lots of them. <laughs> Yeah, it's like in the, the, the channel of Campbell River, right? Uh, where the guys fish for the tie. That uh, a bunch of guys threw, they wired a whole pile of Christmas trees together and threw them into the channel. They figured they would uh, create uh, more fish habitat. Eh? And uh, they did, but they also created this unbelievable uh, lure catcher. And for the guys that are, you know, row, you know rowing around their boats, right? And uh, there was a guy up there uh, last year hired uh, a diver. And they're really superstitious about lures there, right? And there's a couple different lures, like a Lucky Louie. And then there's a, another one that when they go up on auction and you know, they go for crazy prices, right? And uh, the one guy hired a diver, right? Figuring, well, you know, he lost about six or seven on the, on, in these trees, right? And then a diver came up with about 40 of these Lucky Louies, right? And the guy thought he, you know, died and gone to heaven, right? <laughs> And the, and, the, and the diver couldn't quite figure out why he, uh, the guy was uh, so overjoyed that the guy brought all that stuff up to him, right? Because the diver just thought he was just bringing up junk for the guy, right? But uh, I don't think my flies are worth that much money that I would hire a diver to go get them. <laughs> just snap them off and put a new one on. Well, thanks, Al. That was... Good, I enjoyed that. Good. Yeah. I yeah, just about forgot about it. This when I looked at the email this morning. Like, oh crap! <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Thanks, so, Al. Very this, informative. I'm going to tie some flies now. Ooh, that's good, Dennis. <laughs> <laughs> good, Dennis. Everybody, just take care. Yeah, you too. too, Dennis. You bet. Yeah. Thanks, Al. Yeah. Talk yeah, to you guys bet. later. <laughs> yep. Cheers, everyone. Thanks, Al. Yep. Anytime. Thanks. Thanks, Al. Thanks again, Al. Yep. See you, Bob. See you, Darren. Thanks, yeah. Camp, for uh, all the technical effort. No problem. Worked out really well. Yeah, it was awesome. Thanks very much.